Hey, no laughing in church. <laughs> Hi, Carol. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Don't you dare call me sir. <laughs> Servant, but not sir. Right? Huh? You weren't. So you're going to get to pick up tonight. So we're gonna, you're going to get to pick up where you left off then? Did you hear last week? No. Oh, my gosh. You were on the road trying to get home, I would imagine, at this time. You're trying to get home this time last week? Well, I'm glad you made it back, even though it wound up a little spendy for you, but yeah. Hello, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Gosh, you know, we're kind of getting to that time of year where the sun comes in those windows, and every year it's like you see these cycles happening, and it won't be long, it'll be dark for months. I don't know how they do that in Alaska when it's dark for months. I couldn't live there like that. And I couldn't live there when it's light 24 hours a day either. Yeah, I don't think I would like that. No. Anyway, good to be with you all tonight. Good to see you. Trying to figure out where we're at. Oh, there we are. We're going to be in 2 Kings tonight if you want to open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5 is where we're going to start. Hope you all are doing well tonight. Good to see you, and thank you so much for coming out tonight for Bible study. God is good, amen, all the time. We're going to continue uh, in Second Kings and watching the life of Elisha, some of the incredible things that uh, Elisha did pretty amazing man. That is 2 Kings chapter 5, if you're wondering. <clears throat> is everybody there? Does everybody have a Bible? All right. How about if we pray, and then we'll move forward from there, okay? Father, we want to thank you tonight for your love, for sending your son, for calling us your children for saving us, Lord, we thank you so much that you saw value in us, that you would send your only son to take our place on that cross. I want to thank you for that above and beyond all things tonight, Lord. May we never take that for granted. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to gather again in this place. What a blessing it is to come together and open your word, just to read through it and observe it and, and learn from it. So, Father, we ask your blessing upon our time. Lord, I want to pray for any of those who might be uh, dealing with sicknesses tonight in our, in our fellowship and uh, uh, whatever problems, Lord, if it's uh, financial trouble, whatever it might be, God, we know that... Uh, you're in control. You, you have our best interest at heart. Uh, I just want to pray, Lord, for uh, those who might be feeling bad tonight. And just be with them, God, and bless them. Heal them. Raise them up. Now, Father, as we open your word, Holy Spirit, we do look to you to be our teacher. To open our eyes and our spirits to these things that we're going to read tonight. So that we might draw from them things that would help us to grow also, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to continue here looking at Elisha's life, pretty amazing man. We've seen quite a few pretty cool, uh, last week we looked at several great miracles that, that took place through him, and uh, tonight it continues. So let's go ahead and pick this up in chapter 5 in verse 1. Now, 
It says, Now Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. And then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and he told his master, saying, Thus and thus, said the girl who is from the land of Israel. And then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king read the letter that he tore his clothes and he said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So again, we have this um, picture of a lack of trust for sure. I guess there's all different kinds of schemes and scams that that uh, leaders would put out on each other to try to get the upper hand. And the king of Israel here obviously thinks that this is also some kind of a scam. Now this man, Naaman, he is a commander. He is, uh, it tells us he's a great man. He's an honorable man. And, uh, but he has one big problem. He has leprosy. And, uh, of course, as the Syrians would go out and raid the villages and all, they would take slaves, and, and they wind up with this young gal who uh, becomes Naaman's wife's uh, servant, if you will. And so this letter is written to the king of Israel uh, re- requesting um, that his servant Naaman would be healed of leprosy. I think it's interesting when we look here in verse 5 um, that he took treasure with him to meet the king of Israel. Um, and you look at the treasures that he brought, one of them was ten talents of silver, which probably doesn't seem like very much. And then, uh, uh, of course, we see 6,000 shekels of gold. Now you're talking some money. And odd. He sends with him ten changes of clothing. And as we read on, we find out right away the king is going to need a new set of clothes right away because he tore his clothes, right? As soon as he gets the message, he tears his clothes. And he's asking this question, who am I? Am I God? Why did he send this man to me? How, how could I help this man? Uh, this must be a scam. There must be something going on. Maybe he's trying to pick a fight with me. And so in verse 8, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, can you imagine that being the headlines, you know, and the daily news? The king tears his clothes, you know. I mean, what a strange thing that, uh, that the king would do that, to, to tear his robes. So Elisha hears about the king of Israel tearing his clothes. And so he sends to the king, and he says, why have you torn your clothes? Please, let him come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. In other words, the man is ill, and of course, uh, king, you can't do anything for him, but there is a God in heaven. There is a God in Israel, and the God in Israel, of Israel, has a prophet. And so send the guy to me, and uh, we'll see what God wants to do here. So 
Naaman went with his horses and a chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. So Elisha sends a messenger out to him. He says, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you'll be clean. But Naaman became furious, and he went away, and he said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me, and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and he went away in a rage. So again, I think we mentioned this a couple weeks ago uh, concerning the river, the Jordan, um, that it's not always the cleanest looking water around. You know, you think of uh, a river, and of course you think of fresh water and, and all that, but even during this time we see that uh, uh, this, this Naaman, this warrior, Um, goes to Elisha's house, and he stands out front, and he's got expectations. He's expecting fireworks. He's expecting some kind of a show, you know, to make it spectacular. And Elisha doesn't even come out of the house. Um, This man's pride is instantly damaged. He's instantly insulted, um, And not only does Elisha not come out of the house, but he tells him to do the dumbest thing that you could possibly imagine. Go take a bath in the muddy river. Go get in the Jordan where the the water's all murky and everything and and dip yourself seven times. And when you come up, you'll be healed. You have brand new skin. And of course, he's thinking to himself, this is ridiculous. There's a lot better water elsewhere. Why couldn't I just go you know, go down to some other river where the water is clean and it would make more sense in my mind um, uh, to, to do that. And I'm very insulted that he did not come out. He's not waving his hands. He's not going through any kind of gyrations. He's not speaking in other languages. He just says, go wash in the muddy Jordan, dip yourself seven times, and it sounds absolutely stupid to Naaman. Because, why is it that it sounds stupid? Because I think that Naaman is thinking more in the flesh. He's thinking more um, (laughs) the logic of a human being. You know, it doesn't make sense what this man's telling me uh, that I need to do. And how many times do we hear the Lord speak to us at times and we think to ourselves, really, are you kidding? I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, I want you to go and do such and such. Oh, man, you know I'm not welcome over there, God. You know that I'm not a good speaker. You know that I'm not really educated. Why would you send me among them to ask me to do these things that, uh, uh, are you setting me up? Do you want me to look like a fool? I mean, you know, why, why this silly, if you will, request? And he wouldn't even come out of the house. So in verse 13, his servants came to him. And spoke to him. And, you know, calm down here a little bit, you know, boss. If he would just pay attention to the prophet. He said, uh, they came near and they spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? It's not difficult. He hasn't asked you to make sacrifices or bleed, cut yourself. He hasn't asked you to do anything crazy. Just go dip yourself in the Jordan. Why don't you just be obedient? Why don't you trust the prophet and do what he's asking you to do? And so, verse 14, he goes down and he dips himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I like that because, you know, we see here that this disease that was 
so rampant during these times. So many people suffered from this horrible disease. And of course, we know the, the laws that, that God had given about leprosy and how to deal with it and how you were... Well, from this time all the way up into the time of Jesus, lepers were still treated the same. They were ostracized. They were looked down upon. They were uh, judged by people to say, you must have some kind of sin in your life. You must have done something to anger God. You must be unholy in some way. Otherwise, God wouldn't have put this disease on you. And that's kind of the way people thought back then. And I think that even in our time that we live in now, uh, people tend to think the same thing. If you're not healthy, if you're not wealthy, if you don't have all the comforts of home, then evidently you're doing something wrong. God's not, quote, blessing you, right, with all of the monetary uh, things that we would maybe consider blessings in our life. Some people um, are called, I hate to use that word called, but in a sense it's true, they're called to deal with difficulties in their life. Some people never get relief. Some people go through their whole life suffering with one thing or another until they take their last breath. But does that mean that God doesn't love them? Does that mean that they've fallen from grace? Does that mean they don't have enough faith? And, you know, this is where sometimes we get into kind of a dangerous area because this faith discussion, this topic of faith that floats around in the church, um, it can be weaponized, if you will. It can be used to condemn people and make them feel second class, if you will, um, to have somebody come up and, you know, uh, it happened... I even hate to refer to it, but it happened to my daughter-in-law when she was sick with cancer. And somebody in the church approached her and said, you know, if you just had enough faith, God would heal you of that, that breast cancer. Or maybe you're harboring some kind of evil inside you that you need to deal with so that God can heal you. Well, neither of those things were true. And it's real easy for a person who's healthy and financially well off, um, maybe popular, maybe having status or authority in, in the church, and real easy for them to make comments like that. I've noticed a lot of times when I see some of the, oh, if you will, health and wealth and prosperity groups. You see them on TV, you see their massive arenas and their beautiful giant planet on the stage that's revolving and, you know, they got all this stuff going on and the camera scans the audience and, you know what, everybody's dressed to the nines, everybody's handsome and good looking and they're all doing quite well. And it's easy for a person who's, who's having life handed to them like that to be critical of people who aren't until something happens to them. Then the tables turn. Then the shoe's on the other foot. And I've seen that happen also in my experience here at this church. Some people that would say, oh, you just don't have enough faith. You know, you need to use faith. Well, we have faith. We have faith unto salvation. We have Faith is like a muscle, and the more we use it, the stronger it becomes, the, the, the more effective it becomes. Now, what is, I mean, how do you define this? Isn't faith trusting? Isn't faith having that deep knowledge inside of us that God has me in the palm of his hand? And if he calls me to have an illness and to bear it patiently, then so be it. If, if he blesses me with finances, then that's a nice thing too. If I'm handsome, well, that's okay too. But guess what? We're all getting old, right? 
None of us look like we did 40 years ago. I'm sure of that. You know, um, you know, gravity starts winning the battle. And uh, maybe that's because we don't have enough faith, you guys. You know, if we just had enough faith, you know, we wouldn't look like this. So it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a very uh, uh, unfortunate thing that people want to take others' misfortune and, and attempt to uh, make themselves look good in the midst of someone else's suffering. So somebody comes up and says, well, girl, your problem is you don't have enough faith. That's why you're sick. And if you just believe God, you'll never be sick. And then what happens? Two years later, that person gets sick and they die. And you kind of want to run over and knock on their door and go, hey, tell me about the faith thing. Right? What happened with your faith? Why are you now in that person's shoes that you were condemning two years ago or whatever, you know? Lesson, a hard lesson to learn in a very difficult way. I think bottom line is we trust the Lord with all of our heart. And every single one of us is called to a certain station in our lives that we need to be faithful in it no matter what that might be. Um, my very good friend, Dan Bellows, who's in heaven now, but I remember years ago, he used to tell a story about his aunt, and she lived in one of them iron lungs. Remember those things back in the day? They were just a, like a round tube. She had, I can't remember what the disease was that she had, but it was incurable, and she had to be in this tube. That's how she lived every single day of her life. And he said, I can remember going to see her as a child and sitting in the room there with her. She had these little windows and stuff in the tube. And she would sit there and she would read scripture to me from inside her little iron lung and be thankful to God for his love for her and her salvation and praying for me and all. And he would sit there in amazement thinking to himself, how can a person be in that kind of a situation but yet be totally, completely content in where they're at at that moment in the Lord. And of course, you know, she, she died young, went home to be with the Lord. Um, but you see that a lot these days with people who are suffering. And you know, you got to remember, it's not because God is mad at them. Sometimes God allows things in our lives so that we can be a testimony to other people. So that we can have other people look at our lives and say, now that's how you handle hardship. That's how a Christian handles tribulation and illness and disappointment and all the things that life throws at us, knowing that I am still, I'm in the palm of his hand, and every day God's grace is sufficient for me. Just like Paul said, right? He prayed. How many times did he pray? Three times. Lord, take this thorn away from me. And what did God do? No, I'm not going to take it away. You're going to live with it. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Can you be at peace with that? Can you still trust me, even though I'm not going to deliver you from the anguish that you're experiencing? Personally... I think, um, Paul, uh, that Paul's thorn was guilt. It was guilt because he had murdered Christians. He had persecuted Christians. I don't think it was because Paul was half blind or because he had health problems or because he'd been stoned and beaten and robbed and left naked and shipwrecked. I don't think any of those things had anything to do with Paul's thorn in the flesh because he said, I glory in my tribulation. So this had to be something different than that. And I, and I have a, a, a feeling, and I can't really say that, oh, this is definitely the thing, because people have speculated forever about what his thorn was. But, you know, I think that Paul struggled with his past. I think he struggled with the harm that he had caused people in his life. And uh, 
he had to deal with that on a daily basis. And perhaps God left that there in him. I know I'm getting off on an off-ramp here, but so be it. Maybe he leaves that in us. Maybe he leaves that in Paul to keep him soft, to keep him humble, to keep him pliable so that he's not lifted up in pride. Because if anybody could be prideful about anything, it would have been Paul. He had a lot to be uh, prideful about, I suppose. So anyway, verse 15, let's keep going here. He returns to the man of God. He's healed. He returns to the man of God, him and all of his aides. So he must have brought this entourage with him to see Elisha. And he came and he stood before him and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Let me compensate you. This is awesome what you've done for me, and I want to give you a gift. I'm going to pay the bill, if you will. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. I think Elisha knew that his reward was eternal. His reward was in heaven. And his reward was seeing Naaman humbled and obedient and healed. What a blessing that is in and of itself. That, that is more precious than any gift that could have been given to him. It was just a satisfaction of seeing this man who was absolutely rebellious absolutely skeptical about what God was asking him to do. But he finally, he becomes obedient, and, and, and we see the results of his obedience. So Naaman said, well, then, if not, verse 17, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to other gods, but to the Lord. He wants some dirt from Israel. He wants him to load these mules up with soil so that he can have some of God's dirt, so that he can identify with Israel and with God's people. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant, verse 18, when my master goes into the temple of Rimon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow in the temple of Rimon. And when I bow in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. And so he said to him, we'll go in peace. And he departed from him a short distance. So even at this point, Naaman's realizes, I'm going back to my environment to my place where we worship false gods. We have this temple, and, you know, I'm going to find myself in this temple again. Um, I need something to take with me to remind me that there is truly only one God, and that's the God of Israel. And so he's sending him away in peace. Now Gehazi, he's Elisha's servant in verse 20, the man of God. He says, look, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and I will take something from him. So now Gehazi's heart is kind of starting to be revealed now. He's a little upset with Naaman and he's upset with um, Elisha for not accepting compensation for doing the Lord's work. It'd be kind of a real bummer if you, you know, show up at church and then you get a bill in the mail, you know, your, your attendance fee or whatever, you know, or God does a great thing in your life and you get a bill in the mail from the Lord, you know. Well, I healed you, so now you owe me this or you owe me that, you know. Um, we serve God because we love the Lord. And there shouldn't be really any ulterior motive for serving God. And Elisha evidently didn't need anything. 
He had everything that he needed. He wasn't trying to become rich or famous or uh, ruler or anything like that. He just, he just wanted to serve God. So that's cool. You don't need to pay me. This is what I do. This is who I am. I'm God's prophet. My payment was seeing you healed. My payment was you realizing that truly God is God. And all those other ones that you've been messing with all your life, they're not. But yet you're going to go back to your home, back to your idol-worshiping society, and, and you know that it's going to be a struggle for you to go into that temple and uh, may God forgive him because he knows that it's going to happen ahead of time. So Gehazi sees an opportunity here. Now, was Gehazi taken care of? Well, obviously. He was Elisha's servant. I'm sure he ate good. He had a roof over his head. He was treated with respect. He got to help Elisha in his ministry, assist him in serving the Lord. What an awesome thing is that, to be able to do that. But now Gehazi's eyes are becoming a little bit corrupt. His, his motives are becoming a little bit corrupt. And so he says, you know what? If you don't want to get paid, I'm going to go chase this dude down and I'll collect from him, right? So he chases him down. He says, uh, verse 22, oh, verse 21, so Gezazi pursued Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him, and he said, is all well? Is everything okay? And he said, all is well. My master sent me. Uh-oh, we're lying we're not telling the truth here. We're misrepresenting God. We're misrepresenting Elijah. Elisha. He says, my master sent me, saying, indeed, just now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountain of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And so Naaman said, please take two talents. And he urged him and he bound two talents of silver into two bags with two changes of garments, and he handed them to of his uh, servants, and they carried them on ahead of him. So I'm not only going to give you what you're asking for, but I'm going to give you a couple of guys here to carry the load. Because he's convinced that Elisha maybe had a change of heart and said, oh, I've changed my mind, Gazi, go catch up with him and and uh, collect the fee from him. So they carried him ahead of him. And in verse 24, when he came to the citadel, he took them uh, from their hand, and he stored them away in the house. And then he let the men go, and they departed. Now when he went in and he stood before his master, Elijah said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant. Did not go anywhere. Lie number two, right? He said to him, uh, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Are you kidding me? Do you think you can hide from God? Do you think that you can do something that God's not going to see you doing it? How ignorant, how ignorant can you be? He said, uh, my heart was with you. I saw what happened. He said, um, is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? He said, man, where's your heart, dude? Therefore, and this is a tough punishment, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, as white as snow. Boy, that's a hard lesson to learn there, isn't it? That's a tough one. So the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. He has this contingency of, what would you call them? Student prophets, if you will. Prophets uh, learning to be pro prophet school or whatever. He said, please, let's go to the Jordan and let every man... Uh, Take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we might dwell. And so he said, okay, go. 
One said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and he said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. So this guy's cutting down a tree and his axe breaks and it falls in the water. And the guy's all bummed out and panicking because it wasn't his axe. He borrowed it. He probably doesn't have one to replace it. And now he's fretting because it was borrowed. And so the man of God said, well, where did it fall? Now, this little miracle is kind of amazing because you think to yourself, really? An axe head? You couldn't go out and replace it? You, or was this all done just to show that uh, God was a mighty God, that God cares about the small things in our lives, right? The things that might seem insignificant, but yet maybe to you or to me, it's a big deal. You know, I borrowed a brother's tractor to do some work at my house. If I break this guy's tractor, I'm going to feel horrible, right? I'm going to feel terrible because I bar That's why I don't like borrowing things because if you break it, then you're in trouble. You're responsible. Well, this fellow maybe felt the same way. His axe head falls into the water. It's, sink it's sunk, and here comes the man of God. and He says, well, where did it fall? Uh, and he shows him the place. So he cuts off a stick, and he throws it in the water, and he made the iron float. Okay, you got me there. I'm, I'm stuck on that one, right? And therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. And he reached out his hand, and he took it. So the axe head just starts floating on the top of the, of the water, maybe on the stick. Maybe it, the stick got under and lifted it up, and it was floating on the stick. Don't know. But very strange situation there. And he reaches out his hand and he takes it. Another interesting, very interesting uh, miracle by Elisha. And so the king of uh, Syria is making war against Israel. And he consults with his servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned him. And he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and he said to them, Will you not show me? Which of us is for the king of Israel? Do we have a traitor in our midst? Do we have an informant in our midst? And, not, and one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but it's Elisha, the prophet, who's in Israel. He tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Whoa, are you kidding? He's got my house bugged. He hears everything I'm saying. I can't do any scheming. I can't do anything to cheat. I can't say anything without God hearing me. This is really frustrating, isn't it? And uh, uh, so Elisha now, he's, he's the bad guy. And so he says in verse 13, go and see where he is so that I might send and get him. And it was told him saying, surely he's in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night, and they surrounded the city, all for one man. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? We're in big trouble. We're in a tight spot. We're surrounded by the enemy. I love this story. He answered, do not fear. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. How many times does the Lord say, don't be afraid? How many times does he tell us when our life is difficult, don't be afraid when we have to go and get a test done and we're waiting for a result? 
Don't be afraid when it seems like, you know, everything's kind of imploding. In our, don't be afraid. How many times is that in the Bible, you guys? 360 times. One for every day of the year. I love that. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. Don't be afraid. Be, don't be afraid because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Interesting. All this young servant can see is the enemy. It's all he can see. All of his thinking, all of his processing information, all of his doubts, all of his fear is all based on seeing the enemy, focusing on the enemy. And so Elisha prays, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Kind of hard to fight a battle when you can't see. Kind of hard to defend yourself when you can't see what's coming, right? But maybe there's something even a little bit deeper there because those who would follow the enemy, those who would serve the enemy, they're doing it in blindness. They're blind. They can't see the truth. If they could see the truth, then they would be serving the Lord and not the enemy. So Elisha said, Elisha said, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So he's got this, this whole army with chariots and horses following him, and they're all, I wonder if the horses were blind too, I don't know, but they're all following him, thinking, you know, he's going to take us to the place that we need to be, and uh, so it was when they came to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see, and the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and there they were inside of Samaria. Now, when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And then he prepared a great feast for them. <laughs> And after they ate and they drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. I don't think I would want to go back either, right? Now, is that not God's grace or what? These are the enemy. These are the ones that were deceived. These are the ones who were blinded. But yet, Elisha chooses to show mercy to them. He shows what kind of God he works for. And you know, that's exactly what we're to do also, to show mercy. I'm sure there's a lot of instances in our lives where re revenge would be absolutely appropriate, but we choose not to do that because of who we are. And I think sometimes it blows people away when they think, wow, you know, you could have taken me out, but you didn't. What is that? What's different about you? Well, I get to tell you now why I'm different. I get to tell you why you're spared this misery, because God loves you. And, and because he loves you, I do too. So I'm going to show you uh, the mercy of God. And this particular enemy, they decide that uh, they're not going to mess with Israel anymore. Now, it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, he hasn't learned much. He gathered his army, and he went up, and he besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. 
and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. So they're eating donkey heads and, and dove poop. That's what they're surviving on. And it's, uh, the economy's really bad, and inflation has really taken hold. Unemployment's at record highs right now. Um, the whole country's turned away from God and, and liberal, and here they are suffering because of how they've uh, uh, behaved themselves. And as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? The answer, of course, is no. And then the king said to her, What's troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give me your son, that we may eat him today, and we'll eat my son tomorrow. Wow. So we boiled my son, and we ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give me your son that we may eat him. But she's hidden her son. So now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes again. A lot of clothing tearing going on here in these chapters. And as he passed by the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Burlap. Itchy clothing. Uh, not very comfortable. He said, God, do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Saphet, remains on him. This is all Elisha's fault. If Elisha would just leave us alone, this would have never helped, happened. But Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how his son this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is it not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him. And then the king said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer. Wow. Pretty rough when you give up like that on God. When you blame your calamity on your foolishness and you blame it on God. Why is it people have such a hard time admitting their sin? I think that that's why Christianity um, is unpopular with people. They don't want to admit their sin. They don't want to admit their evil. They want to admit that they've fallen short of the glory of God. They don't want to admit that all have sinned. As a matter of fact, we don't even like to use that word in our society. Sin. Wow, that's from the dark ages, guys. Where'd you get that from? You know, obviously this person has a dysfunction. Obviously, this person has been damaged in some way. They're a victim, right? That's why they're, they do what they do. Well, in the end, we're accountable for our own actions. In the end, God sees and hears everything. Not only does he see and hear everything, he sees our hearts. He knows the intents of our heart. He knows your thoughts before you even think them. Now, if that doesn't put the red light on to say, I better watch about even how I think, because God can hear my thoughts, maybe it gives us kind of a clue to what Paul tells us in the New Testament about renewing our mind, about what we should be thinking about what we should be meditating on. Should we be meditating on other things or should we be meditating on things that are lovely, praiseworthy, of good report, things that bring glory to God, things that lift people up rather than tear people down? 
And is it possible for me to be able to do that with my corrupted little brain? Absolutely. Because I'm feeding on God's word. I'm listening to his spirit. I'm walking with him day in and day out. And I'm learning every day what it means to be a believer in God. And we get opportunity every single day to go to school. I remember a guy that I was, uh, <laughs> that I used to live with for a long time. Uh, he used to always say, just remember, every day is school. When you're a believer, that's what it is, isn't it? Every day we're learning more and more about God, about the world, about ourselves, about salvation, and about God's faithfulness. And Paul tells us over and over again, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let it be the dominant force in your life. And you will be amazed. All that bitterness that you used to have, all that unforgiveness that you used to have, it will, it will just fall away. It'll be like shackles being unhooked in your life. You've been dragging that big old heavy ball around with you all these years. And the Lord's saying, just let it go. Let me take that from you. You've been wrestling with it and fighting it and pulling on it. And he's like, you don't have to do that anymore. You can lighten your load. So are you, are you heavy laden? Are you bummed? Are you stressed? Well, if you're that way, then he says, come to me. I'll give you rest. I'll take that ball and chain away from you, and you won't have to carry it anymore. You weren't meant to carry it. You weren't created or designed to carry it. And I think that that's something that applies really to each and every one of us as uh, Christian people. Because we all come from the world. We all come from out there when we come to the cross. We all come down the same path to find the Lord. And no matter what those difficulties might be, the, Jesus is still saying, come to me if you're heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Matter of fact, he goes further, take my yoke upon you, right? For my burden is easy. My burden is light. I'm not here to weigh you down. It's interesting when you think about that yoke because there was always, when they would yoke up these animals to plow the field or whatever, they would have the lead animal in the yoke and then they would have the trainee animal next to the lead animal. And since they were yoked together, the lead animal would show the trainee animal how to do the job, right? And that's exactly what the Lord is saying. Yoke up with me, and I'll take you on this journey, and I'll show you how to do it. But I'll carry the weight. I'll carry the burden. The challenge here, of course, is can I really do that? on a daily basis, I say, yeah, you definitely can. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let's finish it. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. And what's he going to do? He will direct your paths. Amen? Father, thank you so much for that promise. Because, Lord, our brains, they get in the way all the time. Our emotions get in the way. And, Father, we just want to have our eyes fixed upon you. We want to be yoked up with you, Lord. We know that your way is the right way. We know that your ways lead to salvation and peace. So, Lord, as we go from this place tonight, please help us, God. We're weak. We're needy. Lord, we need you more than ever right now in these days that we're living in. Each one of us, Lord, is dealing with something in our lives. 
And we need to remember to, yes, to lay it at your feet, Lord. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.